Wow, this next lady is going to blow you away. The name of her book, Thorns on the Rose, Transformed by the Experiential Knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Sharon Chambers Jefferson, what an incredible life she has led and what she's gone through. Here's the hashtag. She just said it to me when we were off the air. Muck and mire. Getting through the muck and mire and wow, smelling the roses, I think on the other side. So Sharon, thanks for coming on Author's Corner here on America Tonight with me, Kate. Thank you for having me. So what made you write the book? What drove you to write the book? The absolutely bottom line truth was, I had been told for years and years, your book is a story. Going through recovery uh, because of drug addiction and so many, many other addictions, when I would share, people would just gasp like, wow, that is a story. You need to write a book. And I heard it for years. And when I say years, I mean more than 10 years okay but at the bottom line in 2015 god closed every door that had been so uh um open so wide i was so blessed in so many ways and he shut the doors like on on my job where i just received a 3500 um uh, increase okay salary increase and on a Friday soon after, I got that promotion for doing such wonderful things as the director over the substance abuse program. A friend, dear friend, had known her for years, came in and said, "Miss Jefferson, you're terminated. And I'm like, what? Why? She said, your credentials are outdated. And I just hit a button on my computer because that's where my credentials were updated. I said, that's not true. You can see the dates right here. She act like she couldn't hear and couldn't see. She handed me my letter of reservation. And so I said, well, wow, I've never been terminated before. What do I do now? She says, "Uh, take as much time as you need, but you got to be out of here by five. (laughs) Whoa. Wow, what's going on? But I knew what was going on. I know that God had told me right now, you're just being absolutely disobedient. That's what you're doing right now. Make it excuses write the book so literally i wrote the book because he shut down everything that made it clear that what that's what he wanted and so i sat down with all of my doubt and insecurity that had told me all of my life up until even that part that there was nothing worthwhile in me nobody wants to hear another drug addict uh uh, uh, story okay like mine but it wasn't true it wasn't true. So when I wrote, I sat down and wrote the book for that reason. Because I had too much experience with disobedience to even, with my eyes open, walk into disobedience. I had been whipped enough. Okay, Lord, don't whip me no more. I will obey. Wow. And so when you go to pour everything out to just be so transparent, how you grew up and you, just, you know, in Los Angeles uh, to a single mother, seven siblings, and so much hardship and not knowing, you know, who was the biological father, poverty, lack of stability, that really does something to you, doesn't it? It really does. And no accident, God is a God of, okay, attention. The fact that my recovery led me to uh, school to get my credentials to be a counselor, substance abuse counselor, showed me all of the things which made such a difference in my life to understand why out of all seven of my mother's children, I was the only one who chose that path. So learning that the number one reason for substance abuse is pain and being able without a doubt to identify the pain I'd been in most of my life. Okay. There, there it was right there. Wow. Wow. I got the benefit of going to school and learning about substance abuse and the effect on the brain and society and the effects it has which made so much difference in my life. I had to go back in a hurry. I got to go tell all the addicts, it's not true, it's a lie. You don't have to live nor die like this. 
Wow, and how did that make you feel that you were able to share that information after everything you'd been through? Again, it gave me a piece of what I needed, which was to be valued, to have something valuable. Um, my, my, my character, I had been a know-it-all, okay? Not really knowing anything, okay? Having no truth, just a perspective. And my perspective, I fought tooth and nail that my perspective was good enough, close enough to truth until I found the word of God, which confirms that the only truth is God's word because it doesn't change. My perspective would change from morning to night. It never stayed the same. Wow. But to get the truth, to understand this is the truth and to line it up with the word of God made the difference. When did you, when did you really, cause after cocaine addiction, all the things you talked about, I mean, an 18 year battle with this, and, and the children you had, and then getting through that. When did you find God? When did you find, you know, G Jesus Christ? When did you find that in your life? I didn't find him. He was there waiting for me all the time. The truth is, but like addicts understand, we ignore bottoms. Okay, we hit the first bottom. Like when I lost my first child and my first marriage, they they both went at the same time, and that just made me go deeper into self self-pleasing it's all about me that just made me go deeper into the muck and mire but after my first my listen i had three children born in my addiction okay so when their father when their father who fell in love now he was a pastor and a, a, a master's degree math mathematician a teacher a pilot he was an amazing man who fell in love with what i called myself at the time jezebel he fell in love with me and all I wanted was crack cocaine. And I told him, okay, I'll stay. I'll be your woman. I'll be your wife, mother of your children, but you got to let me do this. And what happened I didn't expect is was for him to get turned out, for him to get caught up in the addiction. And the night of January 13th, 1988, when he went to get one more rock after I begged him, he, he usually responded to me with yes of everything. But I begged him, we had enough. We've already ruined his son, was, is our oldest child, Robert, who was 13 on that day, January 13th, father died that day. And I told him, we already ruined Christmas for Robert because Robert was aware, he could see the mess. I said, let's not ruin his birthday too. But Bobby being addicted at the time, he left. Here's the other thing, I believe that God separated Bobby from his flesh to save his soul but not just his soul, but the soul of his children and me. Because that night when Bobby didn't come back and the phone rang and his brother said, is Bobby there? And I said, you know, he's not here. He's at your house and you tell him to get home right away. It was the hardest thing to hear when he said the police just left the door and they said Bobby's been involved in a casualty on Normandy and Imperial. And so his brother came to my house and I said, take me, I got to see. So I took our nine month old baby to our Robert, who was 13, and said, watch the baby, I'll be right back in the middle of the night. And I went out there and identified Bobby's body before the coroner got there. And that reality of him being my provider, him being my everything, I got three babies, I'm 31 years old, what am I gonna do now? And that's what I paced the floor asking myself, what am I gonna do now? And that's when the experiential knowledge of God showed up so real in my life and said, what can you do? And knowing me like he did, I thought again, because I always had a move. And I came back and said, I don't have anything else. He said, will you let me have it now? And that's when I surrendered. Wow. Wow. What a, again, it's like the, the title of your book, Thorns on the Rose, transformed by the experiential knowledge of, of the Lord Jesus Christ. When you think of that story that you just told, and you know, you say, even in the very beginning of the book, have you ever considered that most people love roses, but hate the thorns, but you can't have an authentic rose that doesn't have thorns. They're part of the same beautiful creation. That goes perfectly with your story. That's why you named the book, what you named it, right? Yes. That was funny though, before I was knowing there was never going to be a book, 
love for roses. And I had a rose garden tattooed across my back from shoulder to shoulder, all different colors, all different sizes, but, and they all had thorns and every thorn had a date of some calamity that I had been through. A shooting, a fire, another shooting, falling down and breaking my face, losing everything again and again and again. So every calamity I went through was dated on, my, on the thorns on my back before I knew it was going to be a book. God was there all the time. This was his idea all the time. Wow. Wow. And you know, you have, it's so interesting. We talked off the air and you told me such an interesting story. First of all, you're related to Mahalia Jackson, which is amazing. And your okay. grandmother was a reverend. What? Yes. Tell us about that. Well, um, my grandmother and my grandfather of Bowley, Oklahoma, which is which was one of the first all black towns in Oklahoma. My father, my grandfather was um, the man in history who captured Burtwell of the pretty of the pretty boy Floyd gang. They yeah. were bank robbers at the time. And uh, the story is that they told them not to go over there messing with their niggers. <laughs> and uh, my grandfather and his men captured that man. That put Bowley on the map. Wow. So the McCormicks, that's my grandfather, my grandmother, my grandmother, like I said, being at one of the first all black town. Uh, my grandmother was the reverend over the town. And so to know the word says the seed, we sow seed, we sow seed that go on longer than we sowed them. And they bring fruit more than we expected, bad or good. So I believe right now what I'm living is from my grandmother's seed. So powerful. When people read <laughs> your book, book, what do you hope they take away, Sharon? I would hope that they would take away that there's an answer to all their problems. There's an answer for them, and his name is Jesus. And to know Jesus is to know the Father. And he has a plan, a plan for good and not for evil. And he really wants you to have it. So much more than you can think, ask, or even imagine. Wow, your story is amazing. This is a must read. It is so, so good. Sharon, thank you for coming on. Thank you, Kate.